the government, commerce, and your wallet that grows ever lighter. Today on The Grid. The Grid, a digital frontier of freedom. It's our platform where we talk about faith, politics, and commerce, where we analyze current events from biblical and common sense perspectives. I'm so glad you knocked. The door is open and we have answered. Come on in and welcome to The Grid. Welcome believers, family, patriots alike. I'm Chris Coleman, the founder and CEO of the Kingdom Patriot Group, and welcome to The Grid, our flagship podcast production. And today I have a co-host and our production uh, manager, Sean Griffin. Sean, thank you for being here today. I, I love producing The Grid. <laughs> I know I know you do. Well, let's <laughs> jump right into our topic. Ah, just kidding, because we don't ever do that. And why, Sean? Because it's time first for... Our sponsor. Oh, no, 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 no. I failed the test already. And I, we've done, this is our 97th episode or 98th. I've lost track. The news and review. The news and review. So let's do the news and review and then we'll be back. Boy, you can't turn on the news today without seeing some story about Hamas and Israel. And I just cannot believe how the media tries to normalize the two. Israel defends itself, and there's collateral damage with citizens. The terrorists are trying to kill citizens. That's their primary goal. And yet the mainstream media, the UN, all of these folks are trying to normalize this as an equal morality conflict, which is Absolutely crazy. Well, now the United Nations is demanding a full investigation into Israel's response to these attacks. Yeah, whatever, UN. You are a front for jihad. I'm not listening to you. Neither is most of the world and certainly not Israel. Also read this week that Democratic Senator Joe Manchin is leaving the Senate and some speculate he's actually attempting to resurrect or maybe even start a third party political party meant to unite the right and the left. Probably similar to the Tea Party, although the Tea Party was really more meant to unite conservatives. Um, anyway, I say this because there's a real chance to flip this seat. That is coal country. Joe Manchin was elected as a Democrat in West Virginia, primarily because he was a very popular governor. But that state is conservative, and we need that seat. So speaking of flipping seats, this week's elections were at mixed at best if you're a conservative. And at worst, just another election cycle in which the GOP massively underperformed. And our leader of the GOP at a national level, she's got to go. I mean, she has presided over loss after loss after loss. And I don't know when we're going to get our acts together. In fact, in Virginia, there was uh, actually modest optimism that Governor Youngkin's popularity and through tremendous effort would actually take both the House and the Senate in that state so that there would be the trifecta for the Republicans. No, nope, didn't even come close. Other than a few races here and there, in my opinion, uh, at least in the states that matter, complete underperformance. What's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over, but expecting different results. Also saw this, the IRS just adjusted its tax brackets for 2024, It'll help some folks because it makes the ranges wider, which might help you not getting bumped into the next tax bracket. But why do I even mention this? I do because I hate the IRS. That's why. They might as well say on the 1040, on you know line one, when you do your tax return, line one, how much do you make? Line two, send it in. That's what I think of the IRS. Um, so surprising news, a Christian high school student in Chicago won a $150,000 lawsuit against a public school that made her participate in idol worship, an ancient Hindu ritual. Now, as I read this story, it wasn't the $150,000 that I was cheering. It was what happened to precipitate that that really brought me gloom. So I'm glad that one that the lawsuit was won in Chicago, of all places. I mean, that is surprising. But this student was told to bow at the foot of an idol to help her, quote unquote, internalize the mantras and bring her to Zen. And we wonder why the Lord is removing his hand of protection, his hand of favor from our country, our cities, and our communities. It's because of stuff like this. Also saw this week that energy operators are warning Biden that his green agenda threatens the U.S. power grid. Really? You talk to anybody who works at a nuclear plant, they will tell you this is the case. We simply do not have the 
the grid capacity to do what he wants to do. We don't. So what are we going to do? We're going to burn more coal to produce more electricity to power more power stations to charge more Teslas. And we're going to call that green energy success. Now, my last story of the day um, is also one that just got me fired up. This administration just mandated pronouns to be used in the federal government. Now, some are saying, and rightly so, that this is a violation of the Constitution, particularly free speech. No doubt this is going to be challenged in court. But you know this is not the first time, right? Michigan has done something like this and actually made it a felony to misuse someone's pronouns with the intent to harass or bully them. I mean, this is crazy. Very vague, very open to liberal interpretation. And I said to someone this week, if China invades us with a ground army of a million people, well, really a billion soldiers, because that's probably how many they have, the vast majority of our country is going to fight. They're going to fight for freedom by defriending China on Facebook and using the wrong pronouns to offend them. I mean, come on. It's so sad. Unless you live in Texas, pretty sure China will start their ground invasion in California, not in Texas. Texas would not be taken. Too many guns and freedom-loving Americans live there. For this week's News and Review, that's a wrap. When I grow up, I want to work for a woke company. Like super woke. When I grow up, when I grow up, I want to be hired based on what I look like rather than my skills. I want to be judged by my political beliefs. I want to get promoted based on my chromosomes. When I grow up, I want to be offended by my coworkers and walk around the office on eggshells and have my words policed by HR. Words like grandfather, peanut gallery, long time no see, no can do. When I grow up, I want to be obsessed with emotional safety and do workplace sensitivity training all day long. When I grow up, I want to climb the corporate ladder just by following the crowd. I want to be a conformist. I want to weaponize my pronouns. What are pronouns? It's time to grow up and get back to work. Introducing the number one woke-free job board in America, redballoon.work. Man, you just got to love what Red Balloon is doing. Thanks, Andrew, for all that you're doing to push back against uh, wokeness. Sean, we, we just, we, we can't say enough about those guys. No, we can't. They, um, they've got it going, and I certainly did love that commercial. That was awesome. That, that was good. <laughs> Very good. All right, to today's topic. It's, today is all about commerce, and Sean, it does not look good. Are you concerned about our economy at all? Uh, yeah, we've got the highest rate. Uh, we're we're north of what thirty trillion dollars in debt. I've lost track. I think it's over thirty three now. I can't remember, but it's yeah. It seems like I heard thirty three, but I was, I was hoping maybe I was wrong. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Yeah, it's it's pretty bad. I there's so many different angles that we could take, um, but I think I would like to start with electric vehicles today. What do you think about that? Uh, I do, because it seems to be driving a significant portion of the economy. Wow. Okay. Dad jokes. We, we, we've got dad jokes on the grid now. Um, all right. I'll, I'll jump right in. The Texas Public Policy Foundation recently completed a study. Apparently, the way they approach this is one of the first of its kind. And the idea was to examine the true cost of electric vehicles. That means not just the acquisition price, but all the costs that go into the maintenance, the electricity, and so forth. So they didn't look at just the single item, like the car battery and the products that go, or I should say the minerals and things that go into that. But they looked at the federal subsidies, state subsidies, the strain on the electric grid, because that is real. Even some of the federal fuel efficiency programs and how that plays in, it was, a, it was just a wide, full encompassing review. Now, Sean, I haven't told you what that said yet. What do you think they found? I'm going to use a technical term. And that technical economic term is called crap. Ah, okay. I bet we could make an acronym out of that. Probably. Um, well, then I will tell you, the big takeaway from the study is that electric vehicles cost, would cost almost $49,000 to own over a 10-year period, absent of the $22 billion of annual government incentives. 50 grand, Sean. That's what it would cost over 10 years, 50 grand. Now, mm. does that sound like these electric vehicles are actually saving the consumer money? Now, just to clarify, you're talking 
that much money over 10 years just to operate it? So you 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 stole my thunder there a little bit oh, because sorry. that's okay. I was really trying to tease the audience here. No, let's talk about what that number really is. I'm sorry, that's not the true cost of operating the vehicle over 10 years. That's how much more it would cost. Oh. So we're exactly. So we're talking not $50,000 for what a lot of these electrical vehicles cost. We're we're talking about 100 grand Sean over over 10 years. 50,000 more than they currently cost. Mm. That's insane. Yeah, I mean, that's wow. So to me, this really gets into the neighborhood of unintended consequences. And so when I when I think about that, I mean, you know what the law of unintended consequences, right, Sean? Oh yeah, the, I refer to it as the ripple effect, but yeah. The ripple effect, unintended consequences, whack-a-mole. You hit one, another one pops up. So a lot of people don't realize this, but our federal highway system is actually supported by a federal gas tax. Were you aware of that? Yes, due to a podcast that we did some 60 or 70 podcasts ago. Yes, I was baiting, baiting you there. Here's the challenge. Federal efficiency, fuel efficiency standards have continued to increase. So cars are getting better and better and better gas mileage than they used to, which means it takes a lot less gallons of gas to drive down the same amount or more miles down the road. Well, how do you pay a gas tax? You pay it with every gallon of gas you put in your car. If you're putting less gallons in your car on a less frequent basis, that's less tax to the government to maintain those roads, right? But then you add to the fact that there's probably five, six, seven times more cars on the road than there were 34 years ago. So you've got three, four, 500% more usage of the roads, and yet you have on a per vehicle basis probably one-third, one-fourth, one-fifth of the tax that's actually being paid to support that. Hmm. Law of unintended consequences. That is the ripple effect. What about the strain on our electrical grid from these charging stations? So having recently lived in Michigan before we moved to uh, Texas in the land of the, the free and the home of the brave, um, we had some friends who worked for the nuclear plant there and they told us all these Tesla charging stations that you say have going next to Panera and these other places. If there were many of those, the electrical grid would crash. They cannot support electrical vehicles in this, this rapid charging. They just can't. It's not there. Well, Sean, what are the primary sources of electricity? Where are they primarily generated from or what types of plants are they generated from? Well, the ones that give us continuous power are coal and natural gas uh, and nuclear. And nuclear. That's right. Coal and nuclear. Nuclear is considered one of the more clean, the clean ones, but there's been all these moratoriums of not opening up new, new uh, nuclear plants. And we've tried all this wind and solar, but you know what? Solar just doesn't work at midnight very well. It, no. I, I mean, lots of experiments on that it just doesn't work. This is kind of the unintended consequences, but it's also almost a little bit humorous because what you have is we've got to save the environment. We've got to save electricity. We've got to save, well, not really save electricity. I should say we've got to not burn fossil fuels. So we're going to do that by operating and charging electrical vehicles that require more fossil fuels to produce the electricity, to charge the vehicle. That's not going to use fossil fuels. Does that, does that make sense? Exactly. And and there's the other factor that gets overlooked frequently is when it comes to the renewables, even if wind and solar worked consistently, they have to be attached to a battery. They have to be attached to storage. And our batteries are not mature enough to handle the capacity that is needed when you've got to have constant generation. Great point, because the technology has improved, but the technology is not ready to replace the current system and infrastructure that we have. And so what you're really seeing is you're seeing the government, this, this is what it looks like when the government is completely embedded in the economic engine of a society. The ability to buy a car or buy the one you want or drive it the way you want, it's all controlled. And so 
I say that because these electrical vehicles, based on what you just said, Sean, would never have seen the light of day absent of all these subsidies because the technology isn't there. Car companies cannot make money on electrical cars at the current price point. If they raised them to the price point where they could make money, they couldn't sell them. So what happens? The government subsidizes. And that's where it's really, really challenging because in the, in the world of true capitalism, products come to market when the technology is ready to bring them to market because capitalism requires that you make a positive margin on the products and services that you sell. But the government, on the other hand, they just either borrow money or raise taxes to fund the gap or the shortfall. Now, this is just a side note, but one time I was telling my daughters, I was telling them both that they can open up a lemonade stand on our neighbor or in our neighborhood on opposite sides of the street. And I told the one girl, hey, I, or the one daughter, I think you can make some money on this. But, you know, you've got to take into account the cost of the, of the lemonade powder, the water, the cups, all of that. And then the other daughter I told, I said, this is, you got to do the same thing. But if you don't make money, I'll cover all your expenses. And the other one said, that's not fair. You can't do that. And I said, and you just got your first lesson in government intervention into the economy. Um, anyway, a little side note. I, the fact that the government borrows money or raises taxes drives me absolutely nuts, And it, remind, it, it just reminds me of what Reagan said. This is one of my favorite. I've got a lot of favorite Reagan quotes. But he said this, the government is like a baby, an elementary canal with an insatiable appetite on one end and absolutely no responsibility on the other. Do you think that describes our government and our government's economic policy pretty well? Uh, I do. And it, it gives me an idea for a podcast. We should just do Reagan. We we should do quotes. He had another one that um, was closely tied to this. He said the government's economic policy could be summed up in a few short statements. And it was, it was something, um, something like if it moves regulated, if it keeps moving, tax it, if it stops moving, subsidize it. <laughs> and it's like, yep, that's pretty good. All right, so I, I that 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 one hit a, hit a funny bone there. So Sean, let's switch gears. Sounds great. What's up next? You tell me. There's we got a lot to choose from. How about inflation and interest rates? I know that for some people that is time for them to reach over and hit snooze, but you've actually got some really good stuff to cover. I think inflation and interest rates is a great idea. So first do we need to talk about this, Sean? Because have we solved it? Have we solved the inflation problem? Uh, no. It, uh, things are still going up while, uh, you know, our incomes are not. If if anyone listening to this podcast says, yes, we have solved it, then I'm guessing you're at the income level that someone else does all your shopping for you. No, the, the answer is we clearly have not. And Politico just reported uh, within the last, I, I want to say it was 24 hours, or the last day or so, that annual inflation, how we basically annualize each quarter's inflation, it surged to almost 5% in the last quarter. And in fact, the Commerce Department used these words, the economy expanded last quarter at the fastest pace in more than two years, and more than twice the 2.1% annual rate of the previous quarter. So that means inflation picked up, it doubled its increase from last quarter. Sean, if you ask me, that sounds bad. Well, this is where it could come in handy to do a, a little splaining because um, I, what I don't quite understand is if the economy grew, then how is it that inflation is an issue? There's something there I'm missing. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you said that. So the way the economy grows is based on the value of gross domestic product. That's how that's typically how it's measured. So the goods and services that are flowing through the economy is what determines the growth. So when prices go up, you literally can have no more units or widgets being sold this quarter as opposed to last quarter. But if you increase the price 10%, then your growth would be 10%, if, if that makes sense. The, so the growth is actually artificial. Can be. Yeah, it can be. I can't speak to in this particular case, but I know I know price increases is certainly a part of this. The other part that really drives growth is consumption, or I should say inflation is consumption. Consumption is nothing more than the end result of demand. And despite where interest rates are, despite 
um, the Fed trying to curb inflation, people are still buying, which in theory is good, but because the demand is so high, it's causing goods and services to increase. The economy, aka, is just hotter than it really should be. The other reason why it's bad, Sean, is how do you pay for all this increased consumption? You got to do it with your own money. And if you don't have the money, what do you do? You borrow it, right? You borrow it with credit cards. You borrow it from your HELOCs. And there are there is evidence that's showing that people's debt level is rising very fast as opposed to the beginning of COVID. Why? Well, remember, the government was pumping money into people's pockets. They were pumping money into the economy and overheated the economy, thus the place uh, that, that we're at. So the, the Federal Reserve has one tool in its tool belt to try to curb inflation, to try to stop the growth of, uh, of this inflation, of these prices are spiraling out of control. And that is to raise what? The interest rate. The interest rates. You know how many times the Fed has raised the interest rates over the last couple of years? I, 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 I do. Without looking at the podcast notes, did you know that? <laughs> no, I did not. Okay. I was actually shocked when I oh. read your notes. So how many times is it, Sean? 11. 11 times. And that's only because this last time they didn't raise it at all in mm. the, this last quarter. So think about that for a moment. One quarter. I mean, it was like rate after rate hike after rate hike after rate hike. They stopped for one quarter. Inflation doubled. Inflation doubled. Folks, this, this inflation is sticky. It is hard and it's not going anywhere. And even now I saw that the average mortgage rate, Sean, uh, for a 30 year mortgage is, is upwards of 8%. I, uh, I don't know what your mortgage is, but my, you know, the one I had in Michigan was 3.3%. And the one I have today is like six and a quarter or something, 8%. We probably wouldn't be in the house that we're in if we were paying an 8% mortgage. Yeah, I don't recall what mine is. I mean, it's numbers. I don't do math. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Well, so, and here's one of the other challenges. I've, I've become interested as of late in real estate investing. And I'm seeing all this conflict of data. On one hand, investors believe the housing market is really strong and it's going to stay high because there's a nationwide shortage on, on housing. Like the inventory is, is low. But on the other hand, we're really at the breaking point of inflation and mortgage interest rates. Even though, even here in Texas, where the demand is really strong, I've talked to some of the builders when we were looking for a home and they're feeling it. The cost of their capital to build a house is increasing because of these interest rates. And because the homes are not selling quite as fast, they're having a hard time churning the cash flow because the, and the banks are tightening up liquidity. The banks are like, we're not gonna, we're not gonna loan this money out to near the degree that we were. So what does that mean? We can't build homes as fast as we otherwise would like to do. I see this conflict, Sean. At some point, this is going to be a, it's not going to be a conflict. It's going to be a collision of housing demand, high interest rates, cost of capital, and shortage of inventory. And when I think when it collides, it's going to be ugly. Well, there's another factor too that is very rarely ever mentioned that I would like to just kind of toss out there. There are a lot of companies that are purposefully buying up residential homes, you know, homes intended for individual families. And they're doing that with the purpose of turning around and leasing them out. The World Economic Forum, their plan for the planet is that you will own nothing and you will love it. And that is that strategy of buying single family homes and then turning around and renting them that takes them off the market for anybody, for any family that wants to actually own a home because that group, that company uh, has a, uh, they're in a better situation financially to buy that home because for them, that's business. Whereas for you and me, that's our livelihood. That's where we're going to live. Those things are also going off the market because of that. And, and, and I bring that up because I get offers on my house almost every week. And there have been weeks where it's like three or four times a week. They're ready to just give me a cash offer. And my house is not on, this, on the market at all. I think that's a great example. And I hadn't even thought of that, Sean, but that is a good reminder because I know over the past decades, there has been a big push in our country to try to increase home ownership 
yet the policies of this current administration are basically unwinding 20, 30, 40 years of effort. And, and in some ways, this, this whole housing conversation, inflation and interest rates reminds me of the electrical vehicle conversation we just had. And, and it's from this perspective, where the government intervenes, we have a slew of unintended ripple effects, unintended consequences. You know, the economy took a big dip during COVID, at least the, I should say the early part of COVID, everyone felt it except for Amazon. Amazon became a cash cow. I mean, everybody sat at home, they, they ordered their product. Um, well, then you had policy, some of the policies that Trump put in place and you started to see this significant economic recovery. Then Biden was elected. And, and as you and I were discussing, all of a sudden he starts just basically saying, I'm getting rid of everything Trump did. I don't care what it is. I don't even know if he knew. It's just if Trump did it, it must have been bad. And so he got rid of some of these policies that Trump had put in place, some of these executive actions. And um, it absolutely blew money into the economy. It overheated the economy. And that's how we ended up where we are. Government intervention and unattended economic consequences produce disaster. Consequences that impact every aspect of commerce. The kind of commerce that you and I, we deal with every single day. It gets impacted that way. So, Sean, um, do you still think that the U.S. government is not impacting the commerce that impacts you? Maybe I should ask, did oh. you ever think that? Oh, I, I, yeah, from the very moment that I heard Biden was canceling the uh, XL pipeline, I was like, what a dramatic mistake. I have visions of toilets being flushed. You know, I, I normally wouldn't do this on a podcast, but I feel like I need to correct that statement. Okay. It was a dramatic intervention, not a dramatic mistake. It was very intentional. Just wanted to call that out. Yeah, it was intentional, all right. It was sabotage. Thank you. It, it wasn't something that was accidentally done. They, it was they've done been, with... every, every stinking thing that they do is sabotage. It's but, like, oh, don't get me started. We could go on for we, a good solid hour just listing the things that they have sabotaged. We could, um, but instead of doing a bunch, I do have one more that I would like to to touch on that I just read about liquid natural gas. Are you inviting me mm. in? Can I can I share that story? Come on in, man. So I don't know what this stands for, but th this actually occurred at the beginning of September. It's just that we're now hearing about it. The PHMSA. It is a is an agency of the Department of Transportation. They issued a federal rule suspending a 2020 authorization on transportation and rail tank cars under the uh, the Trump administration, and it was they suspended the authorization of this transport of liquid natural gas. So what does that mean? Well, it means by the stroke of an executive order, it's illegal to transport liquid natural gas via rail, you know, via train. Well, you think about this huge, massive cars that are transporting all of this. There's only a couple ways you can transport liquid natural gas. It's either by pipeline that this administration, as you just pointed out, I mean, that the Excel pipeline, that was, or the Keystone Pipeline, that was uh, oil, but still natural gas is transported either by pipeline, by rail, or by truck. And by far, truck me is the, it, it means the least amount of product flows at the slowest, at the highest cost. It's so bad that 25 Republicans recently sent a letter arguing that this agency is actually designed as a safety agency, which is a whole nother podcast about exceeding executive authority. This agency is supposed to ensure the safe transport. They are not to be the environmental agency. They're not an agency that's supposed to say, you, we're going to stop doing this or not doing this unless there was a safety concern. And they, their own data showed that this movement of hazardous materials on the highway is way less safe for the public than it is through rail. So the Republicans continued in this letter. They said this, this rule was part of a broader attack on domestic fossil fuel production that willfully ignores the attended harms to consumers and national security. Totally agree with that. They even went on to say, you know, this effort comes from the highest levels of administration, which also makes sense because the Department of Transportation, where do they report through? It ain't Congress. It's executive branch. It's President Biden. And they say that President Biden specifically targeted this rail rule and through all his uh, climate crisis activists. And that's why he went after that. 
And so I, th- I think we see, Sean, this is just another example, political agendas drive political actions and decisions that have devastating commerce and economic consequences. Sean, when you hear this story of something like this, how do you react? Again, sabotage. This is deliberate sabotage of the economy. It's deliberate sabotage of a way of life. It's a deliberate sabotage. They're trying to sabotage anything related to fossil fuels so that they can push us faster to electric, but they fail. They are willfully blind to the fact that that technology is not mature enough to handle it. Unless they're not blind, and this is just part of a more sinister agenda, which I think we're actually going to get to as we talk about the faith, politics, and commerce impact of what we see in our world around us just like this. Right after this. You're listening to The Grid, a podcast production of the Kingdom Patriot Group. You can find us at kingdompatriot.us. That's kingdompatriot.us. And now we're on YouTube, so be sure to hit like and follow and subscribe to keep up with the latest episodes. We'd love to hear from you. We read all your comments. Let us know if there's a subject you'd like us to address. The Grid, the intersection of faith, politics, and commerce. Mondays on your favorite podcast player. And now on YouTube. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Okay, Sean. Um, I know normally we'll take a topic like this and we'll say, well, let's let's take a look at this. Let's analyze this from a faith, politics, and commerce perspective. But as I was thinking about this and kind of meditating on it, I really believe the Lord um, has has led us to take a little bit more of a holistic approach in discussing those things, really from a single perspective, a single lens. So can I just jump right in? I think that's a great idea. So that single lens, and and quite frankly, is always the best lens, the best perspective on any kind of current events that we're looking at, is Scripture. So I wanted to go to Revelation 13, and I just wanted to read this short passage. And this is what Revelation 13, verse 11 starts with. Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all the authority of the first beast on its behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, those fatal, whose fatal wound had been healed. And it performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full, full view of the people. Because of the signs, it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast. It deceived the inhabitants of the earth. It ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. The second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads So they could not buy or sell unless they had that mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. Sean, that is sobering. That's very sobering. It is. Yeah. And and people just don't understand. This is coming soon. It's coming very soon. And I, I think as we read that passage, do we see faith, politics, and commerce just in that single packet passage? Oh, we sure do. I mean, obviously you can't buy or sell without it. So that's commerce. That's commerce. You have to worship the image of the beast. Um, that's faith. They want you to put faith in this man and you're, you're, you have to receive a mark in order to show your loyalty. So that's faith. That's worship. And then it's the law of the land, baby. It's politics. Absolutely. That, that I think that's so important to see because as we focus on those things, as we talk about those things here on the grid, as the Kingdom Patriot Group was originally formed, it was around these ideas that these the intersection of these things we can see in Scripture. We need to be attuned on this so we can pray against it, so we can be prepared, and so we can also not be deceived. So in response to this, what do we do? How are we to act? What is our hope? For me, I'm reminded of, uh, I think it's Matthew 24. I think it's Matthew 24. Anyway, he he tells us, Jesus is speaking, and he, he tells us right up front, 
not to be deceived. It's possible for people to be deceived. Deception is what is really going to be the big thing, the all-encompassing thing during these end times. And the hope, I think, that we have is if we know what Scripture says is coming, then we will understand when things are presented before us that are deceiving. And that is going to spare us. Not only spare us, but I think it gives encouragement. When you see scripture play out, when you see uh, when you see the life around you, the world around you, when you see it play out as Jesus said it would, there's there is some there is some deep-seated confidence that you know what Jesus has got this. He knows what he is doing. And I, I know today as we talk about this, especially that passage in Revelation, it can be weighty. And that's okay. We don't, we typically don't talk about just issues on the periphery here at the grid, right? I mean, we discuss weighty things. We discuss things that have eternal implications. I, I also think, Sean, we would be remiss if we also didn't encourage our listeners. And I think you started to do that with Matthew 24. Um, and ironically, that's what I wanted to speak on today is the last part of Matthew 24 as well as an encouragement to our audience. So I think that's really cool because I know that you hadn't hadn't seen that yet. Not that part, no. But but Jesus is being asked. He says, don't be deceived. And he's being asked about, well, when are these things going to happen? And, you know, when is the when is the end time clock going to strike midnight, so to speak? And here's what Jesus, this is how he answered. Watch out that no one deceives you. That's the part that you were referring to. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumor of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. I don't mm. know about you, Sean. That's one of my that's one of my favorite scriptures in the New Testament. Believe it or so not. I'm going to jump in here. Okay. Now we do have notes most of the time when we're doing, we've got two of us on the, uh, on the screen here, we've got, uh, we have notes. Chris does our, does the writing for our content and we confer on what the subject matter is going to be, but I don't always get a chance to see the full, the full notes. And though I had them because I was busy taking care of other things, I did not see this last part. So, but this right here is an example. If you know what scripture says, if you know what it says, it is going to help keep you from being deceived. I know what the scripture says. I didn't know he was going to bring this up. And yet that's exactly what happened. When we know what the scripture says, it helps prepare us for the times that we're going to have and the times right now before the rapture. This is the end times and we're in what I believe scripture calls the perilous times where things are happening all over the place. You know, you've got volcanoes and earthquakes and terrible storms and economic ruin and wars and pop-up wars and rumors of wars and diseases and just wickedness breaking out all over the place. But if you know what the scripture says, we can take comfort that Jesus is about to come. Absolutely. And it, it may seem odd that we're bringing this up in what I would call our encouragement segment, but just let me run with this. Jesus used the exact analogy of this is the beginning of birth pains. And as with everything that Jesus says, everything in scripture, but certainly that Jesus says, there is intentionality with everything that he, that he does. Every word he spoke, there's not a mistake. So why would he use that? Well, here's what I think. I think it's because of those of you who have had children and have watched the birthing process, you know that contractions begin and they begin mild and they begin infrequently. But as you go along, the birthing process, they increase in frequency and they increase in intensity until they become all-consuming, exhausting, very painful, and they ultimately culminate with a hard, exhausting push 
that leads to one of two outcomes, the glorious birth of a child or complete tragedy. Those, those are the outcomes. I think Jesus was incredibly intentional in using this as an example. For those who know Christ, who are in Christ, that final push of history will result in Christ's glorious appearing as we're raptured, the destruction of the enemies of God and the beginning of his millennial reign. For those of us, I shouldn't say us, for those who are not in Christ, that final push of history will be devastating. As you experience the full unfettered wrath, not only of the enemy, but even worse, of God himself. My hope for you is this. Be in Christ. Place your faith in Christ. Give your life to Christ. Make him Lord of your life. It is not too late, but the time draws near. The frequency and intensity is already happening. Jesus is coming. Don't fight the call of the Holy Spirit any longer. Surrender. Give your heart to him. Sean, any final thoughts? Uh, you're spot on. Another thing of encouragement that I would that I would offer is uh, elsewhere. He says that that these days will be marked. They will be like the days of Noah, where people will be eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. But it's like, wait, stop, halt! Don't go all the way to the end of that sentence. Let's stop the sentence at it will be like the days of Noah. Stop. Dot dot dot. What were the days of Noah like? Human humans got so wicked that the Lord God Almighty decided he needed to dispense judgment and do away with all of them. In fact, was grieved except, that he had ever made man. Except for eight people. Eight people. He was grieved that he'd ever made man. Folks, that's Jesus' description of the end times. He says it will be like in the days of Noah. Well, stop there. So if it's going to be like the days of Noah, that means we are going to see unparalleled wickedness. I mean, just squirting out everywhere. And how is that hope? That means he's soon coming. Yeah, he's I was going to say, I mean, it almost sounds like it might not be encouragement, Sean, but encouragement isn't always you're wonderful, you're great, you're the best. Sometimes encouragement is hard truth that will save your life. Well, if you think about the birth, okay, it's a bloody mess. It is. There's blood. There's some guts that come out, you know, they got to snip off. And, you know, there's the baby has got to be cleaned up right away and taken care of right away. But it's a mess. It is a mess. But glorious. Indeed. Mm -hmm. And then mom immediately forgets all of the ugh, that she just went through when she sees that child and she's handed that precious little thing. Yeah. It is sweet. Well, I just want to say thanks, Sean, for co-hosting today. We want to thank all of our listeners for, for being here. I really take the conversation as encouragement. Know Jesus. That, that's certainly my, my final words. And as we wrap up today, we want to thank who for our sponsor, Sean? Red Balloon. Thank you, yeah. Andrew Krabbersheds. Andrew Krabbersheds, you you go. We, we love your commercial. We love what you're doing. Uh, we support you here at The Grid. I guess I just want to say to everybody, just thanks so much for listening to this episode. Really, it was, it was on my heart today. Make sure you visit our website at kingdompatriot.us. Uh, we want you to join the movement of faith and freedom. We need your help. We also want you to tell your friends, your family, your neighbors about this podcast production, The Grid. We, we By doing that, you help us spread the word. You can, again, you can hear us on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and pretty much any other podcast platform or player that's out there. Give us a five-star rating. That's important as well. Um, and if you're only listening today, I want you to know that we're on YouTube. I mean, we're, this video is on YouTube if, if you're only listening on those podcast platforms. Be sure to subscribe there as well and follow us. We'd appreciate that. Um, your membership is appreciated. Your input is valued. Your voice is needed. I'm Chris Coleman. And I'm Sean Griffin. And, and we, we are Kingdom, Kingdom Patriots. Patriots.